We have some handout notes available for you. Dominus got them right here, so if you haven't received a copy, raise your hand and she'll get one to you. I have somebody's uh, Nerf darts from last Nerf night here. I don't know who wants to claim the purple one and the white and neon yellow one, but uh, they're here. And if you're sitting in your, your seat there and you notice some darts laying around, just know that was from last week's Nerf night battle. So here they are. The walk of shame for anyone who actually comes up to get them. No. You're, uh, but... That's what explanation, if you see any of those in the pew rack in front of you, that's exactly what that is. But uh, thank you uh, for being here. Thank you for joining us online. Those of you who are just tuning in, I have you here on my phone. And uh, welcome to you all as people are checking in. Indeed, it is a chilly morning here in Summit County, and that has made its way into the church building with the heat out. And uh, contrary to what the world might say, that there'll be a lot of hot air in here uh, with the preaching, it's not the truth, uh, for we are going to be listening to the actual words of God that he has recorded for us in Scripture. And so what an honor it is in a life out there when it's hard to trust what you hear and see and all of that. Thankfully, we can gather in a place where we can uh, deal with the unchanging word of God the God-breathed, the inspired word that uh, transcends culture and time and current events and pandemics and political stuff, and it transcends all of that, and it gives us a great focus. We can just keep pressing on. So um, why don't we go before our Lord in prayer, asking him to teach us, and then we'll get into it today. A lot to cover today. Lord, we want to just thank you indeed for what we were just now thinking about in light of a crazy world out there where it's hard to trust anything we see and anything that we hear. Thank you that you have given us your word that is infallible and inerrant that we can come and study it and know that we're actually studying your words which speak the truth, truth that's, that uh, transcends time, that transcends culture, that transcends every country, that transcends all of the current events that we face. It uh, not only um, in many ways describes the types of things we will face, it gives us, Lord, the understanding of how to live through them. And so help us as we open your word today, uh, your sovereign Lord, so we know that this passage of scripture is uh, timely for those of us, um, whether it's what we need at this exact moment or something that we'll need later in the day or week, uh, we just know that this is for us today. And so please speak your word to us. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're headed back to James chapter 2. So go ahead and uh, turn there in your Bible. We will be starting in verse 21 today where we will complete the message of James that we started last week. This is an amazing passage of Scripture, but one that has often been misunderstood and criticized because it gets taken out of its original context. It gets isolated, and uh, therefore people say that it gets contradictory, it's controversial. Um, but before we get into the, the text at hand today, I want to point out some foundational biblical truths, and some of you may be very familiar with these concepts, but don't want to take it for, for granted or just assume that we're all on the same page here. So we'll lay some of these foundational truths, and that'll help us to understand what we're talking about here, or what James is talking about here in chapter 2, verses 21 through 26. Sorry, my microphone is giving me troubles again today. Uh, the fit. My ears are just not big enough or something for this thing. All right. There we go. Now, now we're ready. So, some about foundational biblical truths. According to Scripture, when interpreted correctly, this truth stands firm. A person is saved by faith, and faith alone. But, that statement, though so basic sounding, may need some clarifying explanation at times, 
for a Christian who's been taught the Bible, they understand what that means. They understand those words. They understand the theology behind it. But uh, there are some Christianese, if we can call it that, words in that statement. Words that Christians use in their vocabulary that we understand that have to be understood in light of the Bible. Words like saved and words like faith. But if you take those out of the context of the Bible, people in the world that don't understand the biblical understanding of that, they have the opportunity to completely misunderstand and misapply these things. So if you take this statement out of the Bible and just say it out there in the world, hey, we are saved by faith because God says that, it's true, but they might not understand it. So let's break it down. According to what we see as we study the Bible and we consider the issue of faith, God tells us that the object, the content, and the substance of faith are critically important components if that type of faith is to result in salvation from sin and salvation from spiritual and eternal death. Let's break this down. First, the object of our faith is critically important. We're not saved by faith in faith. We're not saved by faith in a uh, improper object. This morning, it's not uh, out of the ordinary, but I'm wearing some Under Armour. You know that that's often what I wear to preach in. It's good preaching clothing. And so if uh, I were to say Under Armour, well, that means this is armor. And so I can wear this under anything, and I have faith that it's going to protect me. You know, and if I decide to go on a fishing trip up to Alaska and uh, during the salmon run when the grizzly bears are out there, I can have faith that my Under Armour is going to protect me from a mama grizzly bear trying to get ready for winter. And so I can just wear my Under Armour with great faith it'll protect me. And I can even walk by faith up to a grizzly bear and say, bring it. And I tell you, no matter how much faith I have, that faith is not going to save me from that danger. Why? Because it's a, a faulty object of faith. Faith. Yes, we are saved by, uh, by faith, but faith, it's not just a strong belief in something positive. It's not just a strong belief for something better, having a real strong conviction of positivity, or even putting my faith in something that is not worthy of faith, that is not trustworthy, that is not saving in its nature. Faith in faith cannot save. The object of faith is everything. God tells us in Scripture that we are saved by faith and not by works, but the object of faith is Jesus Christ. He's the only object of soul-saving faith. you got to get that right. Second, the content of our faith is critically important. Is faith faith? If we just say, okay, the object of faith is Jesus Christ. Yeah, I could believe that there was a historical figure named Jesus, and they called him the Christ. Um, you know, he was a historical figure. He was a good man, a good teacher. So, yeah, I believe that there was a, a figure in history named Jesus Christ. If he's the proper object of faith, is that the proper content that we must believe about that object? No. We must understand in understanding that we have sinned and that we stand before God as guilty. We need to believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross to receive the punishment of our sin, that he paid the price of our sin, and that after dying and being buried, he rose again, that he is alive. You see, it's important that we have the right object, but we also have to have the right content that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and rose again. That's the proper content. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, about those elements of the gospel, the death on the cross for our sins of the Lord Jesus, His burial and His resurrection. So the object is Jesus. The content 
is that he died on the cross for our sins and rose again. But the substance of faith is also critically important. Faith is a complete confidence and trust. It is true belief in the object and the content, as opposed to, for instance, just a mere intellectual acknowledgement of some facts or some details. Uh, just, we say, is it, is it good enough to just know that the Bible teaches and that Christianity teaches and that history shows that there was a historical figure named Jesus, they called him the Christ, that he died on the cross for the sins of the world and he rose again. And yeah, I understand that's what the Bible says. I understand that's what Christianity teaches. Is that genuine faith? Absolutely not. Any skeptic, any person who's critical of the Christian faith knows those exact same details. We talked last week about what James brought up. Even the demons believe such theologies and it does them no good. It's not just a mere intellectual acceptance of facts. Soul-saving faith from the wrath of God over our sin requires the right object of faith, Jesus Christ. The right content of faith, the facts that he died on the cross for our sins and rose again. And it has to have the right substance of faith that there's actual belief in and trust in him in what he did for me. That transcends just a head knowledge, but it's something that hits me in my heart. And it's something that is evidenced through what I do with my hands in this life as I work for him. That's faith. Simply put, it's been said similarly and by many different people over time, but we are saved by faith alone, but saving faith is never alone. Saving faith is accompanied by good works in obedience to God. When faith has the right object, the right content, and the right substance, it will also have the right evidence, the evidence of good works. Different writers of the New Testament books and letters addressed these different issues regarding faith uh, from different angles as they wrote to different audiences dealing with different heresies and challenges. And so the, as you look at all the different audiences and all the different angles and all the different battles and you study faith, we find a very full, wonderful understanding of it. The problem is when a person takes one of those passages talking about faith and they take it out of its context and they believe that that's all there is to say about such matters and so they say then it appears that there's contradictions in the bible regarding stuff like faith there's no greater example of a supposed contradiction on this matter of faith and salvation than what happens when you study paul's writings and james writings we addressed it just briefly last week. But Paul says in Romans 4, 1 through 5, and Galatians 3, 6, and 7, that we are justified. That's a fancy theological word meaning declared righteous. Declared righteous. Paul says that we're justified by faith apart from works. That nobody will be justified by works before God. Uh, James goes on to say in our text that we'll study today, chapter 2, verse 24, that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. <laughs> you say, wait a second, that's about as contradictory as it could ever get. Well, when you understand the, bat the, the battle they're facing, the audience they're addressing, the perspective from which they're speaking, we find out that these two are in perfect agreement. We talked about how last week Paul was addressing um, false teachers that were saying faith plus works equals salvation, and James is addressing fools that think mere intellectual acknowledgement and empty confession equates to salvation. These guys are facing two different battles. Jesus and John the Baptist, both in Matthew, as you read through Matthew, 
At times they compare people to trees. And they say that you can tell a lot about a person by examining the fruit. And that the fruit needs to be uh, consistent with that person's beha- or be- beliefs. Their fruit or their behavior should represent their, their beliefs. So if a Christian and their faith were to be compared to a fruit tree, you would describe faith differently as you were describing the different parts of the tree, wouldn't you? Think about Paul. Paul would have been addressing the issue of the root of the tree and of faith. What allows a a tree to have its life? What allows a tree to be a tree? It's its root, its foundation. That's where its life comes from. In speaking of Christians, that's their faith in Christ. Without being rooted and grounded in Him, there is no life. James isn't talking about the root. He's talking about the branches and what uh, the branches produce uh, in, in relation to a Christian and a genuine Christian and their faith. Um, you might look at a tree and say, is that a fruit tree? Well, I don't know. How do you tell if it's a fruit tree? Pff, duh, look at the branches. If there's fruit there, then we say, oh, it's, it's a legitimate fruit tree. If it's not, it's a counterfeit. It may look like a fruit tree, but it's not. You see, salvation And true spiritual life come from being rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ by faith. Without Him, there is no existence as a Christian. There's no life. But a fruit tree, if it's genuinely a fruit tree rooted and grounded in Christ by its very nature and design, it will produce fruit. Paul and James are in uh, in complete agreement theologically relating to faith and salvation, simply put, they're just addressing two different aspects of the Christian life and how faith relates. Paul is addressing how a person is justified in God's eyes. We mentioned last week that God can see invisible faith. He sees the heart. He knows the second genuine faith is activated. He doesn't have to see works. He doesn't have to listen to words. He sees it in the heart. But faith is invisible to the human eye. The only way a human can see another human's faith is when that faith is made visible through the corresponding behavior. As we saw last week, James presented a situation where a person, not God, a person wanted to see another person's faith. He said, someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith, he says. Show me your faith without your works, which is impossible. And I will show you my faith by my works, he said. And that's the only way we can see faith is through the changed life. God He can see through the words. He can see through the works. He doesn't have to examine the fruit. Genuine faith will produce fruit. Last week, as we uh, started looking into this section, James gave us three examples of phony faith. A person who says they have faith, but upon further review, we understand that It's not genuine faith. It's actually a useless, dead, non-saving type of faith. And the three examples of this phony faith were, first of all, a confession of faith without action. Secondly, confession of faith without compassion. And third, confession of faith without evidence, without any evidence at all. There were a lot of people in James' day. There are a lot of people in our day potentially even people here or watching online that are all talk. They call themselves Christians. They associate with Christians. They go to church from time to time. They know a lot of things that the Bible says. They know a lot of things that Christians teach. But it's only an empty profession, whatever this faith is they say they have. A person can say they have faith all they want, but if it's not 
proven or validated or evidenced through works, James says that is indicative of a useless, dead, non-saving faith. After addressing what genuine faith does not look like, he goes on to describe for us, as we'll see today, what faith does look like. Genuine saving faith. And again, to be redundant, <laughs> this is what it looks like to you and to me from our perspective. We're not talking about through God's eyes. That's how Paul was addressing these issues of faith and salvation and justification. James is talking about how it is seen from our perspective. Show me. If you want to be justified in my sight, which in the end doesn't amount to much, but nonetheless, practical Christianity, uh, you say you have faith. Prove it. Show me. This is how James is taking on this idea. So, I know this is a long lead into our text today, but I just needed to lay that foundation before we jump into this. Otherwise, it's isolated from the rest of the Bible, and some are left wondering, well, what is he actually saying, and how does this apply to my life? What do I do? So looking now at the text, James is going to give us two examples of what living, active, saving faith looks like, starting in verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And Scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was credited, reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For just as the body without the spirit is dead so also faith without works is dead. So here are two examples of individuals who no doubt had genuine saving faith. You say, how do we know without any doubt? Well, James' whole message in this whole extended text is that a person with genuine saving faith will reveal the authenticity of their faith through good works. There is no way that these two individuals would have done what they did if it weren't for genuine faith. It wasn't empty confession. So, let's jump into these examples and see how faith was working together with their works in life to prove beyond any doubt to you and to me and to any other human that would ever look at their lives that these guys were not empty talkers. They had actual saving faith. They were justified or proven to be righteous in our eyes. First of all, we begin with Abraham the patriarch. Abraham the patriarch. Probably the best way for us to understand James' text on this letter is to understand Abraham's life story chronologically. Okay, we're going to look at that first from back in Genesis. James presents some of the highlights of Abraham's life, but he presents them out of chronological order. We have to understand that. So we want to observe, first of all, the proper order historically, and then we'll just see how the, the highlights that James presents pulls out of the story to make his point. God appeared to Abraham, uh, at that point in time his name was Abram, and told him to go to the land that he would show him, and that there God would bless him and God would multiply him, or basically give him many, many descendants. Interesting, Abraham's name at that point, Abram means father of many, but he was actually father of none. He had no offspring. And he was getting older in life for sure. Well, sometime later, this is about Genesis chapter 14, Abram had fought a, a massive battle um, to preserve some of his extended family and had won. And in this battle, he gained a lot of uh, additional wealth. 
But uh, after such a highlight in his, in his life, he entered into a really dark, depressed time because he, he realized all of this stuff that he had in this great estate, he had no heir, no son to give it to. All that he had was going to go to one of his servants. And so in this discouraged moment, God comes to him in Genesis chapter 15, and this is a very important chapter. God appeared to him and said that God would give him an heir, would give him a son, and even through that son, his descendants would become as numerous as the stars of the sky. It says in Genesis 15, 6, that Abraham believed what God said. Abraham believed that, and at that moment, he began to have genuine faith, the, the real substance of faith. And as a result, Abraham was declared righteous by God. He was justified by God. This is the moment when Abraham was saved. There's no question. Abraham had saving faith, and we know it because God says that he declared him righteous at that moment. Well, the story then moves on. Time goes on. Uh, Abraham had this promise. He was holding on to this promise, but Abram and his wife Sarai had no son at this time. So they decided to take matters into their own hands. Uh, we could say it was a lack of faith, or we could say that it was evidence that they did believe they were to have a child. They just didn't know how this was going to happen because Abraham was old and Sarai was barren and getting older. And so Sarai had a handmaid named Hagar and gave her to Abraham as another wife. And together, Abraham and Sarai uh, or, uh, and Hagar conceived a child, a son. They named him Ishmael, from whom the Arab nations would descend. They thought this would be the fulfillment of God's promise, but it wasn't. God had something better more profound, more miraculous in mind. And so when Abraham was 99, beyond the years of childbearing, and Sarah, she was far beyond the years of childbearing, but it didn't matter, she was barren to begin with. When Abraham was 99, God appeared to him. That's actually at that time that God gave him the name Abraham. He went from being father of many to father of many nations. And he said, you're going to have a child with Sarah. And so not long after that promise, Abraham and Sarah gave birth to Isaac. In following Abraham's story along, we now, we now arrive at Genesis chapter 22. This is another critical chapter for our uh, consideration today. In Genesis chapter 22, God put Abraham's faith to the test. Was Abraham's faith genuine? He asked Abraham to do something unthinkable. He asked Abraham to offer Isaac, the son of promise, as a sacrifice. It's shocking from the human perspective that God would ask Abraham to do such a thing. And it's also shocking that Abraham was so quick to respond in faith and obedience. Maybe you know how the story goes. Just in summary, Abraham didn't tell Sarah, probably smart, he was actually going to be able to pull this off. He gets up early in the morning, he gets Isaac, and he, uh, they get all the supplies and a couple of servants and a donkey, and off they go. And when they arrive at the foot of this mountain, they get off the donkey, they head up the mountain to do the sacrifice. Abraham gets Isaac, and again, there's a lot of details of this story. It'd be interesting to know, how did he get his son up there? We imagine Isaac was just willing to obey and to trust his dad, but gets his son up there on the altar. And I believe as the knife is coming down is when God stopped Abraham and said, all right, it's obvious that you have faith. And there was a ram whose horns were caught in a bush nearby, God provided a substitutionary sacrifice for the one who was going to die. What a picture, what a type of Jesus Christ dying in our place, we the ones who were going to die. So 
Abraham was completely obedient. It was obvious that he had faith. So, years later, Abraham continues to grow older and he died. Isaac grew up. He had twin sons. One was named Jacob. Jacob had many offspring. Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Then you have the nation of Israel descending from Jacob or Israel. Um, But this is Abraham's story, at least a brief overview of it from the historical account in Genesis. There were a lot of details to his life, but James pulls out two episodes. He pulls out that moment when Abraham was saved, when God justified Abraham because of Abraham's faith, Genesis chapter 15. And then he brings up this moment later in Abraham's life where his faith was uh, declared um, unquestionably genuine faith when he was willing to obey God and offer up Isaac on the altar. Well, let's see. I mean, that's, those are the events James brings together, but let's see how he actually constructs it in his argument here in verses 21 and 22. Abraham, first of all, addresses, or uh, James addresses Abraham's works, his faith-confirming works. Because James is talking about a faith that is visibly seen through obedient works for God, he goes right to the story of Genesis chapter 22. He's not there to defend the fact that that, uh, Abraham got saved back in Genesis 15, though he will mention that. Uh, indirectly. He just jumps right to this story. Chronologically speaking, this was much later in Abraham's life, many, many, many years after he was actually saved. This is the moment, though, when any question about whether Abraham had genuine faith or not was answered. There was no question. A key part of the passage, I believe, is actually found there in verse 23, where James says that the Scripture was fulfilled. This event of Abraham offering Isaac on the altar was not a small, insignificant event. It was a moment that James says fulfilled Scripture. Now, when we think of the word fulfilled from a prophetic standpoint, there's a prediction or a prophecy made, and the fulfillment of that is when it actually happens exactly how the prophecy said. We say that it was fulfilled. Well, this is not talking about prophecy. It wasn't prophesied that Abraham would offer Isaac. But what this is saying, it's showing a validation and a confirmation of something. That Scripture was validated and confirmed. But what Scripture was validated and confirmed through this story in Genesis 22 of Abraham offering Isaac? James tells us. He says the Scripture is this. And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned or credited to him as righteousness. Genesis 15, 6. The moment of Abraham's saving faith that God saw, that God then declared him righteous. So that's where James begins. And then he moves on in verses 23 and 24 to talk about Abraham's faith. The works producing faith. This was something that God could see. It was genuine from the very moment it uh, activated in Abraham's heart. How do we know? Because God said at that moment, he declared him righteous. That's the moment he was saved. But because of the unique position of Abraham as the patriarch of the nation of Israel, God put his faith to a unique test that would vindicate him before all people of all time. There's no question at all if Abraham really believed that God would make a nation out of his son, even when God asked for that son as a sacrifice. The writer of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 11, mentions many different elements of Abraham's faith, but he addresses also, uh, in the midst of all of it, this issue of him offering Isaac on the altar. I wanted to read this for you. Hebrews 11, 17 through 19. It says, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. 
and he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom it was said, in Isaac your descendants shall be called. Abraham considered that God is able to raise men even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. What this text is saying is that Abraham knew that Isaac was the the son through whom all these promises would be fulfilled. But he was still willing to, by faith, offer his son, that son, as a sacrifice, believing that God would have to do something, even raise the sacrificed son from the dead to make this work. He said, I believe that God is going to fulfill his promise, and I believe I need to obey him in what he's asking me here, and I'm just going to let him work out the details. But he believed. There's actually evidence even in Genesis chapter 22 in the historical account that Abraham had faith that God would do something um, in, the, in the outworking of the sacrifice so that Abraham would bring him back. Um, so Abraham, Isaac, the servants, they arrive at the foot of the mountain. And it says in Genesis 22 in verse 5, this is Abraham speaking to the servants, stay here with the donkey and I and the lad will go over there and we will worship and return to you. Interesting. We will worship, and we're going to return to you. So Abraham had faith that even though he was going to obey, God would do something because God made a promise that he had to fulfill. James is trying to prove a point using Abraham. He's not trying to say that salvation is by works. That's not even the debate at all in James' letter. The debate It starts up in verse 14 of James chapter 2. What constitutes saving faith? What does genuine soul-saving faith actually look like in real time? Genuine faith results in works. It produces good works of obedience for God. That's why he's bringing up Abraham in this case. Well, after this example, James brings up another This next example is not someone that a Jew, specifically, remember this was written to the 12 tribes dispersed abroad. They were Jewish Christians. Uh, This was early in the church age when most of the Christians were Jewish. But this this is someone who a typical Jew would not look at as someone who could ever be declared righteous in anyone's eyes. Completely opposite in most every way from Abraham the patriarch, we find secondly Rahab, the prostitute. I say she was completely different from Abraham in virtually every way, yes, except they were the same in the one place that mattered, and it's that they had genuine faith, saving faith. Not empty talk, genuine saving faith that gave evidence through an incredible display of obedience in good works for the Lord. Um, someone may have argued against James, saying, yeah, yeah, you, you bring up Abraham, but Abraham, come on, he's the patriarch, he's a hero, he was someone special. Um, how does Abraham's life relate to the everyday normal person out there? Well, James says, I'll give you another example of genuine saving faith. Let's go to the other end of the spectrum. How about we pull out a, a Gentile, sinful uh, Prostitute woman. Let's take a look at Rahab's story. This goes back to Joshua chapter 2. Joshua chapter 2, chronologically speaking, okay, Bible timeline, she lived much later in time than Abraham. So we talked about Abraham's story, Abraham, then his son Isaac, and then the son Jacob. Jacob had, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Israel had Many sons and grandsons, and 12 of those became the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel. So you have the sons of Israel, the children of Israel that grew into an entire nation. Uh, Remember, one of those sons was Joseph, Joseph who went into Egypt. 
And there in Egypt, things were fine for a while until that family grew into a great nation, a couple million people strong, approximately. And that's when Pharaoh began to oppress them, and God raised up a deliverer, Moses. Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, and uh, due to their sin, uh, their lack of belief, God did not allow them to enter the promised land right away. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Remember that? Moses dies at the end of that time period, and a new leader is appointed, Joshua. And Joshua led them across the Jordan River into the promised land. And Joshua fought the battle of what? Jericho. That was their first big target. And that's where Rahab lived. Okay, so you can see chronologically there's a bit of time in between. But this is set where the Israelites are getting ready to enter the promised land and drive out the inhabitants of the land that God had given to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jericho, their first target. It was a great fortified city, probably the greatest of the day. In that day, it was considered pretty much impenetrable by any enemy. It had very uh, fortified walls. And before the battle, Joshua sent in some spies, James calls them messengers, to go in and search out what was going on. Um, to keep incognito, you could say, about their mission, these spies pretended to be travelers and to do everything uh, that travelers would do in that day. And so they found residence for the night in the harlot's home. <laughs> kind of an interesting way to think about uh, how all this went down. They weren't um, clientele, as it were. They were just uh, um, showing themselves to be like any other traveler who would stay there for the night. So they end up going to one of the local harlot's homes, and the one that God providentially had them meet was Rahab. Again, not taking part in her trade, but just to keep a low profile and to keep any suspicion away from what uh, was going on in Jericho. The people of the city got word that the Israelite spies were in their city and that they were staying at Rahab's house, so they went looking for them. Now, it's very interesting because in Joshua chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, as Rahab and these spies or these messengers are having a conversation, Rahab gives a confession, a profession of faith in God. I want to read this to you. This is what she says to them. I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the terror of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. When we heard it, our hearts melted, and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. Now listen to this, what she says. For the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. What a confession from a prostitute in, a, a pagan prostitute woman in Jericho. Based upon the stories that she had heard from her other traveling clients, <laughs> that then they'd stop in and talk about what's going on out there in the world. They had heard stories of the Israelite people and about their God, Yahweh. And so she says of Yahweh, Jehovah, their God, that He is God in heaven above and on earth, believe, uh, on earth beneath. That, in that day, was a genuine profession of faith. But we know that it wasn't an empty confession or profession, it was genuine faith. You say, how do we know? Let's take a look, was there any fruit? And that's what James is pointing out here. Rahab's faith in action. As the story goes on, she quickly hid these men behind some stalks of flax on her roof. People were coming to search, so she got them hidden. Uh, something to note here, Rahab's lifestyle was unacceptable to God as a prostitute. He wasn't uh, in favor of that. 
Even after Rahab exercised faith in God, uh, she still did what was disobedient. She lied. She uh, boldly lied to the people. Uh, it's kind of an interesting story and concept. Um, lying is never justifiable. But you could say that in a way she was expressing her faith <laughs> in even trying to cover the story up of what was going on to try to protect these people. Uh, you can work that one out. There's no justification for sin, no justifying for lying. But uh, it's interesting that her actions began to change as she did everything she could to protect God's people. Salvation is obviously not through works. Otherwise, a lying, treasonous, prostitute, Gentile woman would never be approved in God's sight. But it was her faith in God that brought salvation, and it was a genuine faith that showed itself to be genuine through her extreme work. When the spies left her house, they told her to tie a scarlet cord in the window, and that if she did, and if she left it there, that when the armies of the Israelites came and destroyed the area, anybody who was in her house with that scarlet thread in the window, would, their lives would be spared. And so indeed, when Jericho fell, all who were in Rahab's house were spared. They were brought into the nation of Israel. Rahab herself married a Jewish man, and of all the interesting things, she was the great-grandma of King David. What? Talk about an interesting story of grace. Because David was in the family line of Jesus Christ himself. Talk about grace. God's saving grace. Faith in a guy like Abraham. Genuine faith at proven through his works. A changed life saves. But even in a pagan prostitute like Rahab. Genuine faith that results in a changed life, even though she had a lot of conduct things to still get worked out. But it was genuine faith. And it brought salvation. And even God's grace to the extent that she was brought into the lineage of Jesus Christ. Wow. So James' point here, please understand, is not that works save, but instead that genuine saving faith does do good works. And those works justify the believer in other people's eyes. I can tell you have been saved if you do the works that a saved person does, that genuine faith does. Otherwise, you can tell me all day long that you're saved, but I can't see your faith. I can tell you what I believe and that I'm a person of faith and that I've been saved, I can tell you all day long. I can tell you the different things that I know about the Bible. But until you see it in a changed life, there's no way for you to know for sure. So we are justified in each other's eyes as we do the good works that line up or correspond to our beliefs in Christ. James finishes his message here with an illustration. He says, for just as a body without the Spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. What makes a body a living, active, useful body? It's that immaterial spirit, the soul. If the spirit's not there, uh, the body's dead. It's useless. You know, you can dress that dead body up to look exactly like who it was. Um, make it look great and all fancy. But it's, it's dead. It's not the person. So it is with faith, James says. It can be spoken of beautifully. It can clean itself up nicely on a Sunday. It can be spoken well of in church. It can know the facts that the Bible teaches and what Christianity teaches. But if that faith does not transform a person's life and produce the corresponding works, it's a dead faith, not real, not viable. <clears throat> so in light of 
all that James has to say, I'd say, uh, what about you? I've had to ask myself the question, what about me? But what about you? Would you say that you are a person of faith? Do you say that you're a Christian? Well, God knows for sure. God can see right through everything that you've said, everything that you've done. He knows whether you have a genuine saving faith. But what about the rest of the world around you, and what about you yourself? We can't see faith. How do we, therefore, know whether faith is real and genuine? All we can see is the behavior in your life and in my life that faith does, the works it performs. I challenge you to take inventory of your life. Do you see the types of things in your life that faith does? Do you obey God? Do you walk in obedience? It doesn't mean your obedience has to be perfect and that you never make mistakes. We'll still make mistakes. But do you have the fruit of genuine faith in your life? If you do, it's wonderful. Keep showing your faith. If not, you may need to spend some time talking with the Lord about your faith. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. If you're here today or if you're watching online, I don't need to explain the gospel to you. We've explained it in great detail at the opening of the message. We've all sinned. The sin that we've committed results in punishment and death from God, the just judge of the universe. Jesus came and uh, was our substitutionary sacrifice. He took our place. He died on the cross for our sins, uh, and he rose again. And it's genuine faith in him that saves. Maybe you've heard the facts and you've known them, but it's time for you to begin to believe them and trust in Jesus to make you right before God. All you have to do is move your trust onto Him, onto Jesus. Stop trusting in other things like your works or your church attendance or the fact that you're not as bad as you could be. Stop trusting in those things. Put it all in Jesus. Accept the work that He has done on your behalf. That's all that the Bible says you must do. It says, in fact, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Anyone. Whether you're Abraham, the patriarch, a hero, or whether you're Rahab, the prostitute, and an enemy nation, anyone who calls out to him will be forgiven and saved. If that's you, I want to pray the type of prayer that a person would pray that wants to make that decision. You don't pray to get saved. But there's a no greater way to express that faith than to tell God about it. You don't have to pray out loud, but you could tell him something like this. You could just say, Father, I confess to you, I have sinned. And I understand that that sin separates me from you, that I've earned judgment but I believe you sent Jesus Christ and I believe he died on the cross for my sins and I believe he rose again. And so right now, I trust in him because of what he has done to save me. I believe he did that for me. I receive it Please forgive me and change me. And may I go forth now in the good works that you have designed for me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we do come to you in thanksgiving that you and your word have taught us all sorts of things about faith. And how faith is the only thing that is required 
for justification in your sight, faith in Jesus Christ. And thank you that genuine faith can be shown, expressed through our good works. And Lord, may we not only talk the talk of Christianity, but perform the works that are involved in genuine faith. And for anyone here, Lord, who is still wrestling with the issue, Lord, help them to come to you, surrender to you in saving faith. All these things we bring to you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you've made that decision today to trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, I'd encourage you to come and talk to me or tell someone about that. Or if you're attending from home, feel free to send us an email. Let us know. We want to give you more information on what it is to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. But uh, thank you all for being here with us today. We will continue on, Lord willing, in James chapter 3 next week about uh, the tongue. Dun, 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 should be the, (laughs) according to James, take on the matter. And uh, definitely a passage of Scripture that terrifies me, not because of of, uh, its difficulty, but because of what it says. It's very, very serious text. So trust you'll be back for that in person or online. And God bless you all. Thanks for being here. We are dismissed.